shy, play with me. My dirty boy, can't you see? Let you be alone next to me. Hey, sexy boy, set me free. Don't be so shy, play with me. My dirty boy, can't you see? You are the one. I try his been a, a partner of ours to make sure we give the best customer experience, give our customer everything that they deserve to be our customer. And I try and make sure that the customer experience is technology savvy, make sure that we are able to give them all that they deserve as a customer to make sure that they're energy efficient as well. The best training you can get to operate the software. Also, um, it's fun. It's a great time to socialize, to network. Networking is the best part of it. Coming here and meeting uh, with the ITRON people, meeting with other uh, partners kind of helps us kind of help set strategy for the upcoming year and what's going on, what's innovative, what, what some of the changes are going to be going on and, and helps us go back to our clients and offer them um, innovative thoughts and innovative ideas. So. Please welcome to the stage, iTron's Vice President of Corporate Marketing and Public Affairs, Sherilyn Moore. I got the eye of the tiger, the fire, dancing through the fire, cause I am a champion, and you're gonna hear me. Good morning. Welcome to day two of iTron Utility Week. Well, first I need to uh, answer a question I've been asked a few times by a few of you, and I think it's important that I um, let you know. If you're wondering what that loud humming sound that was in your head during Scott Klozowski's keynote yesterday, it wasn't you. It turns out that uh, I guess the air conditioning was uh, acting a little sporadic. So after some frantic work on the, the speaking or the speaking or the sound system, they discovered it was AC. So anyway, set the record straight. You're not going crazy. So. Welcome back. So I hope everyone had a successful day yesterday. Uh, track sessions, knowledge center, bull riding. Well, if you did two out of the three, that isn't so bad. So hope you made the most of it, because that's what this is all about, resourcefulness in action and making the most of what we have. So that's what we're doing right now. We're making the most of it. So with that, we've got a pretty uh, straightforward program today. I'm going to talk a little bit about some technology and our, our partner is going to talk about that and then we're going to go into our motivational speaker, um, Steve Farber. So first up, iTron. We launched iTron Riva earlier this month. iTron Riva is iTron's edge intelligence and sensing platform. What we're doing is we're bringing grid intelligence to edge devices. Some of the first devices that we're powering and making available are on display now in the Knowledge Center load control, and smart street lights. So if you haven't checked that out, you need to check out our new Riva uh, devices that are available. And with us today, we actually have our partner, Rob Soderberry from Cisco. At Cisco, Rob leads enterprise strategy, solutions, products, and go-to-market for Cisco's development organization. Rob leads two important Cisco teams, the Internet of Things group that builds rugged, connected solutions for vertical markets. In addition, the cloud networking group that simplifies its network operation by managing the network infrastructure via the cloud. Please welcome Rob Soderberry to the stage. Rob. All right, uh, so you guys all look pretty good in those, those hats last night. I got in about 10 o'clock, and uh, let's just give uh, Sherilyn a hand for a great party. And, and by the way, if you hear a loud ringing sound uh, in the, the uh, hall this morning, you probably shouldn't have had quite so many of those little blue drinks. I don't know what was in there, but they were pretty good. Okay, uh, I want to accomplish three things for you. Uh, first, I want to give you some context of, of where you sit in the energy, uh, water, and, and utility space relative to what's happening in this thing we call the Internet of Things. I want to talk a little bit about the ITRON partnership and, and how Cisco and ITRON are working together. 
and then give you a glimpse at the evolution of technology for IoT, and particularly what we're doing in partnership with iTron and other key providers of analytics and new IoT-ready software capabilities. Uh, so let's start with IoT. Uh, I'm just coming off a, a week at the IoT World Forum in Chicago. Any of you make it out to the forum? All right, a couple of you. Uh, an awesome forum. We have 1,000 uh, business leaders and technology leaders out there really talking about the impact of IoT across industries, across verticals. Manufacturing, uh, energy, smart cities, transportation, logistics, across business after business, market after market, what's happening? Well, what's happening is we're seeing technology move from a, a behind the curtain role in business to center stage. As we start to connect to our assets, as we start to pull data off those assets, we start to make decisions and start to drive uh, business value from those assets. Cisco has published some eye-popping numbers $19 trillion of value at stake in industry by taking advantage of the internet of everything and how we pull people, process, things, and data together to make better decisions. Uh, that sounds like a big number, but of course in this room we have multiple people that could deliver multi-hundred million dollar ROIs from IoT. So those add up. So IoT is, is big. What are we, what, what's happening right now in the marketplace? is that we are having to match thought leaders in, in the verticals and in industry with thought leaders in platforms and technology and bring those two sets of people together in order to innovate and really uh, find value. And that's the heart of our partnership with iTron. At Cisco, we want to be the world's best platform for IoT and for infrastructure, but at the same time, we rely on deep and strong partnerships. And not just a, a marketing bundle, but partnerships where we are co-developing technology, we're learning about markets, we're working together to under, understand those markets. Uh, th we're hitting the three-year anniversary of the, of the ITRON relationship. Um, started with smart meters, moving now beyond to edge compute, large-scale rollouts in multiple, multiple customers, and, and uh, quite, quite successful deployment. So we're really pleased. I want to thank Philip for all his personal sponsorship of, of the partnership. You're going to see Cisco and iTron continue in this next phase as we really move from building the foundational infrastructure to building the applications on top of that inf infrastructure. Now, one of the key things you hear about in IoT and when you start talking about, the first thing is people uh, start to talk about are the things, right? How do we connect the things, sensors, networks? And we've been at that for a couple of years. As soon as you get those things connected though, the obvious next question comes up, which is what can I do to those things? And what can I do with them? And usually what I can do with those things or, or with, with them is some sort of analytics or control. I wanna get the, the, the data off the things, I want to process that data, and I wanna either make you know, non-real-time optimization type decisions or real-time control decisions. And today in IoT architectures, that's gonna be a little problematic. So why is that? Well, we all know about cloud computing and most of our applications are gonna be you know, developed for the cloud. You know, in a highly regulated industry, that might be your private cloud, could be a, a public cloud partner. And in the cloud model, how does it work? Well, it's pretty simple. We bring all of the information to the cloud. We'll write our applications up in the cloud. And then we'll ship the, that information back. We'll ship the control back to the edge devices. So that's a pretty, pretty simple, pretty elegant model. So what's wrong with that? Well, the first thing that's wrong with that is in IoT, you don't have tens or hundreds or even millions of devices. This is not on a people scale, it's on a thing scale. We have tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of devices, right? 20 billion connected devices. So that's a problem. Uh, the second challenge is that those devices can get pretty far away from that core. They could be at the end of difficult networks, could be very low bandwidth, uh, they could be hard to reach from time to time. So the devices can get pretty far from the core. 
And then the third challenge is the cost of that communication length is still high. While you know, the price of, seems like the price of computing and your, in those mobile phones come down every, every year and they get more powerful, at the end of the day, your service provider still gets 50 bucks a month out of you for only a so-so network connection. Well, 50 bucks a month times those 20 billion devices is a pretty significant problem. So th this is the challenge. So how do we solve that problem? Well, we've introduced this idea of fog computing. So and the idea of fog is that we want all the benefits of cloud, dynamic applications, the flexibility, the, the agility, but we gotta push those benefits out closer to the edge devices. With fog computing, we can push compute, analytics, and control right up next to those edge devices, but still control it from the center. So your application developer can think of that as a single logical application. They're not developing embedded firmware on a controller out in the, in the field. They're developing a logical cloud application, but pieces of that cloud application can push all the way out to the edge of the network. So that's the idea behind FOG. Last year, we introduced IOX. And IOX is the, the product instantiation of FOG computing. So what IOX does is, first of all, allows you to connect to anything, but thus the X in, in, in IOX. It gives you, a, gives you flexibility both on the uh, physical interface as well as on the software interface. So IOX is a standard that will support across all of our rugged devices that ha are capable of hosting compute and can be supported across third-party devices and platforms and ruggedized compute engines. And it's how we're gonna make this FOG idea work. So if you have an application developer, that application developer has come up with some good idea for analytics, they create that, they create that little analytic package and then they can use a cloud-based technology to push that analytics package out to IOX which could be sitting out there in a, in a pull top router, it could be in a substation uh, automation package, uh, it could be anywhere in the environment. The bit of code that the application developer wrote is completely independent of uh, which platform or, or location in the network that that application is gonna run. And then that application will connect to the local devices, it'll do the monitoring, it'll, uh, it'll provide the data exhaust services, and then provide the insights back to that cloud-based uh, core. We're providing a, a range of flexibility around uh, the IOX platform, so this can be anything from literally an embedded processor at, the, at, a, at a very low end up to a you know, full rack that could be sitting in the corner of a, of a plant floor somewhere providing higher grade analytics. So what is the big news this week? Well, the big news this week is that uh, iTron's had a very similar vision and that led them to develop the Riva Edge Analytics platform. And as the next phase of our partnership, we're gonna be enabling you to host that Riva pla Edge Analytics platform uh, within the IOX framework and in some of the devices you'll see uh, out on the show floor. So we're bringing together this idea of fog computing and edge analytics with the world-class intelligence for the energy space that, that ITRON brings to bring an integrated solution allows you to take advantage of these capabilities. And it's not just ITRON that is developing for this platform, but it's really a who's who of the global uh, ISV community that are developing the platform. Additionally, there's a, a hardware plug and play, or a hardware sort of pluggability uh, capability. So if you're needing to connect to legacy devices or infrastructure, you can slide in custom uh, hardware adapters to connect to all of those uh, local pieces of leg legacy device or, or infrastructure. So full hardware flexibility, the software flexibility to, to host and, and integrate those applications all delivered in the package. So that's what we're doing with, with IOX. Uh, we continue to work, we continue to work with iTron and, and with many of you as, as customers to help build out these networks of the future. We spent a ton of time over the past couple years on uh, energy and, and the energy sector. We look forward to uh, increasing investment in, in water. And as we look at the opportunities there and some of the stats that Sherilyn just, just showed up, you know, tremendous, tremendous opportunity in gas, tremendous opportunity. Uh, the, 
work we're doing from a downstream perspective here with ITRON, very much complemented by uh, interesting opportunities in the upstream world. Uh, we had large announcements from, from Shell and other energy producers at the, uh, at the IoT World Forum last week. So lots of great stuff going on and uh, couldn't be more thrilled to be here. Uh, I'll have a chance to uh, see some of, of your work and uh, for those of you in the exhibition showcase and talk to a few of you later this afternoon. Uh, but with that, I want to thank you for a few minutes of your time and turn it back over to Sherilyn. Thank you, Rob. We are very excited at ITRON to start collaborating and continuing our collaboration in IoT and bringing that to energy water into our ITRON community. So thanks again, appreciate our partnership and your support. Okay, so now we're gonna get going and continue our momentum today with our next speaker, our motivational speaker and keynote for today. Uh, in considering our lineup for this meeting, we sought a keynote speaker who would be able to interpret for us the roots of leadership to help us know what it is, how to inspire it, and how we can all benefit from it in the years to come. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Steve Farber, who has raised the stakes of leadership to the extreme. Steven is executive coach, speaker, and a best-selling author. His third book, Greater Than Yourself, The Ultimate Lesson of True Leadership, debuted as a USA Today and Wall Street Journal bestseller. His second book, The Radical Edge, was hailed as a playbook for harnessing the power of the human spirit. We believe Steve's approach to inspiring extreme leadership can help us better leaders, help us be better leaders, and back to work and in shaping the future of our organization. Part strategist, part social commentator, and all energy, please welcome Steve Farber. Good morning, everybody. Great pleasure to be with you. You know, I've been, uh, I've been blessed in my professional life with some really uh, incredible mentors. One of them is a guy by the name of Terry Pierce, who is arguably one of the finest executive coaches on the planet. And in, he was writing in the San Francisco Examiner a while back about his experience in coaching executives on leadership. And, and he was trying to describe what happens for a lot of these people when the idea of leadership, when the concept of leadership smacks up against the reality of leadership and what happens internally for a lot of these folks. And I think Terry's words speak for themselves. Tell me if you can relate to this at all. Here's what he said. There are many people who think they want to be matadors only to find themselves in the ring with 2,000 pounds of bull bearing down on them and then discover that what they really wanted was to wear tight pants and hear the crowd roar. The minute, the minute you find yourself in the ring facing down 2,000 pounds of literal or figurative bull, that's when you realize this leadership stuff, it's not about the accolades, it's not about the status, it's not about the applause. We oftentimes put ourselves at risk in order to accomplish extraordinary things, and therefore, it begs some pretty significant questions that we have to ask of ourselves. Now, I've been at this work of leadership development now for about 25 years. I've had the opportunity to work with just about every kind of industry you can imagine, every kind of company you can imagine, from top to bottom oftentimes, in creating cultures of leadership. So leadership is my thing. I've been writing about leaders for 25 years. I've been coaching leaders. I've, I've been you know, speaking about leadership and all that. But I'm the first to admit I don't have it all figured out, OK? I'm not here today as the guy with all the answers. But I have noticed a few things along the way that I think you're going to find maybe even, you know, might even be a little bit provocative and get you to think about your own role as a leader in a different way. Now, let's just get something out of the way right now. For, just, just to be really clear about this, and, and tell me if you agree or not, okay? Listen, I, I, I'm willing to be wrong about this. I, I don't think I am, but I, I'm willing to be. Tell me if you agree. Leadership, fundamentally, has got nothing to do with your position or your title. Would you agree with that? And listen, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be polite about this. I've met lots of people over the years in my work that sit very prominently on their company's organizational chart, have very lofty and impressive sounding titles, have thousands and thousands of people that report to them and millions and millions and millions and tens of millions of dollars on their budget and still have, and this is the polite part, 
a bit of work to do as far as their leadership goes. Do you know what I mean? Now, the other side of that coin is, is just as, if not even more important, I can't tell you, I tell you how, many, how many people I've met that have no positional authority whatsoever. They're not managers, they're not supervisors, they're right there, they're on the front line, they're doing the work, but yet they're great leaders, even though nobody reports to them. By virtue of who they are, what they do, how they approach their work, how they approach their lives, and their ability to influence people around them to change the nature of things for the better. So wherever you are in your company, in your gas company, electric company, water supplier, vendor, where, wherever you are in this, in this utility spectrum, it doesn't matter what your position or title is. The question is, do you choose to step up and lead? And not just lead in, in some kind of uh, a baseline obligatory way, but to lead in a significant way. Are you ready to be what I've come to call an extreme leader. And this is what I want to explore with you, not just leadership, but extreme leadership. And the, the extreme leader, first of all, the phrase extreme leadership is a little bit problematic because it, it's, it's a redundant phrase. There shouldn't be any reason to modify the word leadership with the word extreme. Because leadership, if we're really doing it, it's already an extreme act. Leadership by its nature is extreme because it's about the act of transformation in some way or another. It's taking nothing and turning it into something. It's taking something good and turning it into something extraordinary. It's stretching and growing our own skills and capabilities as human beings and doing that for the people around us. This is already extreme stuff, right? So extreme leadership, on the one hand, is just my way of saying real leadership beyond the position or the, or the title, but it also implies that we're, we're putting ourselves out there in, in ways that we haven't before. The extreme leader is a person who strives to take what I call a radical leap day in and day out. So leap is going to be our, uh, let's call it uh, framework, roadmap, manifesto, operating system, whatever you'd like to call it, for extreme leadership. And it stands for love, energy, audacity, and proof. The extreme leader with conscious intent cultivates love, generates energy, inspires audacity, and ultimately proves him or herself every day. Now, let's start with the one. I want to take you through all of these, but let's start with the one that at least in the context of business is not a word that we're accustomed to saying or even thinking about. We are not even used to using this word in the same sentence as work. And it makes some people squirm, and it makes some people uncomfortable, and, 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 and I get it, I understand why perhaps, but frankly, it's tragic. Because not only is love not inappropriate in the context of business, it's at the very foundation of what great leadership is, and it's at the very foundation of any great, thriving, competitive business. And lest you think this is some kind of California touchy-feely hoo-ha crap, and I can say that because I live in San Diego, uh, let me give you a little glimpse into some of the research behind this, all right? I want to make my case for this. I don't expect you just to take this at face value. Another of my mentors is a guy by the name of Jim Kuzis. Jim Kuzis and his research partner, Barry Posner, have been conducting the most significant body of research on leadership on the planet for 30 years. They published their work in a book called The Leadership Challenge, which I would highly recommend to you if you haven't read. And one of their many findings in Jim and Barry's own words was this. After numerous interviews, they said, and case analyses, we noted that many leaders use the word love freely when talking about their own motivations to lead. Now, to be clear on this, the word, you know, numerous is a little vague. So let me be a little bit more specific. In this case, it means literally tens of thousands of individual personal best case studies in both the public and private sector on every continent on the planet for 30 years. The word love comes up over and over again when people are asked a very simple, basic, direct question, which is, why did you do that? Why did you step up as a leader? Why did you take on that challenge? And that's where you hear the L word. Sometimes you hear the synonyms like care and compassion and concern, but the word love itself is used most frequently. And if you think about this rationally, and if you think about it critically, and most important, if you think about it from your own experience, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I mean, think about this just from, from your experience. Why, why would you stick your neck out? Why would you put yourself at risk in order to accomplish anything extraordinary if your heart weren't in it? 
So listen, it may not be love in exactly the same way that we, that we think about love of spouse or child or significant other, but it is love. It's love of something or someone. It could be love of the cause that you stand for, love of the principles that you believe in, love of the people that you work with, love of the clients that you serve, love of the great future that we can create together. There's got to be something here or we simply don't have the juice to step up. And even if we did step up, without that connection of the heart, we certainly don't have the juice to persist. So listen, I'm a business guy. I want to be clear about that. So I don't, I don't use this word loosely. Um, do you get the sense that I'm embarrassed about using this language at all? Do you? Good, because yeah, I'm, I'm not. I believe that love is the right word. I believe it describes the right experience. But I'll also admit I wasn't always quite so, <laughs> quite so confident in using this language with business people. And I, and I remember one of the first groups that I presented, business groups that I presented this idea to, I was speaking at a conference a conference about this size uh, of, of a thousand uh, engineers. Now, how many of you in this room, I imagine there are more than a few, how many of you are engineers by training? Uh, how many of you are engineers by training, work with engineers, uh, been around engineers, sitting next to an engineer, married to an engineer? Okay, good. So, so you guys, I mean, listen, I've done a lot of work with engineers and scientists over the years, so I'm well aware of the stereotype, which I'll summarize like this. The stereotype of the so-called typical engineer is, I'm an engineer, I don't do that people thing, right? Keep the people out of my way so I can get my job done around here. It's like nirvana for the stereotypical engineer. I know it's, I, I know it's just a stereotype. I know it's not true, you know, for most. Uh, <laughs> but it still made me nervous when I was standing up in front of a thousand of these people from the inter internet and, and uh, telecom industry, and I was talking about love. So I didn't know if this was going to fly or not. So I was being hyper aware of and sensitive to the body language because I was trying to see if I was getting through or not. And from what I could tell, I was actually connecting pretty well. And then a couple days later, I got back to my office and I had an email from somebody in that group who was a manager of land technicians, you know, network guys. And at least I got through to him because he wrote to tell me, he said, hey, Farber, you know that love stuff you were talking about? He said, you're right on, man. He said, I've been telling my guys this since the day I became a manager 10 years ago. And I thought you'd appreciate seeing it in his own words. Here's what he said. I've told my technicians to make the customer absolutely love you, take you home to dinner, love you, meet the wife and kids love you, because if the customer loves you, you could blow up their building and they'll say accidents happen. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not the best business strategy, by the way. But this, this does tell us something really interesting about the nature of the, of the customer, the client relationship, right? Now, as I'm looking around the room and kind of checking out the age demographics in this room, um, I will tell you that, that a lot of us in this room grew up in the same generation. Um, I'm 56 years old, and I grew up in the, in the generation, in, as a business guy, the generation of Tom Peters. Now, how many of you have ever read any of Tom Peters' books or book covers, perhaps? Yeah, oftentimes that's as far as it gets, right? So Tom's original claim to fame was a book called In Search of Excellence, right? And when In Search of Excellence came out all those ungodly number of decades ago, one of the principles that he and Bob Waterman talked about was that it's, and this was considered radical at the time, that a business should be, in their words, close to the customer, right? Close to the customer. This was, this was groundbreaking. It was. The, the idea that a, that a company should consider the experience of the customer and then, and then organize their strategy around making that a satisfactory experience was, was really kind of, kind of a mind blower. But now, here we are in this day and age, and we look around and we say, you know, customer satisfaction. All right, well, you know what? Nowadays, customer satisfaction doesn't mean squat anymore. There's no correlation, virtually no correlation between the satisfactory experience for a customer and all the, the, the word of mouth and repeat business and, and loyalty. None. And now before you get all huffy with me on this, I'm not saying that customer satisfaction is not important. What I'm saying is that it's become so important that it's a baseline expectation everywhere we go. It's just the entry into the game. We expect to be satisfied in, 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 in everything. That we, in every company that we do business with, in every encounter that we have as customers, we expect to be satisfied. So what does that mean? It means there's no longer any competitive advantage in creating a satisfactory experience because they get that anywhere, right? But when they love us, when they love us, when they love the way we respond to their needs, both articulated and even more so unarticulated, when they love the relationship that we create with them, 
when they love the way that we, that, that we can you know, solve the issues that they have, that's where the good stuff comes from. That's where the payoff comes from. That's where the loyalty comes from. That's where the forgiveness factor comes from, as our friend here is telling us, when things don't go according to plan. So, to say that love has no place in business is crazy. It's insane. It's just damn good business, really, if you want to think of it that way. And we experience this everywhere. You know, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. We can tell if there's heart in, in the work. Let, let me give you an example. Um, I do a lot of traveling. And I was out in Boston a while back to speak to the senior management team of a company that at the time was called Sovereign Bank and has now been, uh, they changed their name to Santander, which, you know, that's who, who owned them from the beginning. Uh, now, Santander is a regional bank and does not uh, have a presence in California where I live, so I'd never actually been in one of their branches. So I was doing the usual thing that I do in, in preparation for an engagement with a client. I spent some time on the phone talking with the senior executive team to learn about their company, their competitive landscape, their objectives, and all that good stuff, right? But I'd never actually been in one of their branches. So I got to Boston a day early, which is kind of unusual for me, and I took advantage of the extra time uh, to, to finish up some business that I had going on back at home, which required getting a couple of documents notarized, okay? So I went to the concierge at the hotel, told him I, I needed a, a notary, and he said, well, you know, we don't have one here, but there's a Santander branch right across the street from the hotel, and I believe they have a notary there, and I'm sure they'll take care of you. So I thought, cool. This way I could do a little field research, you know, do a little ghost customer thing, and get my personal business done at the same time. So I walked across the street, and there was a little branch, just two tellers sitting side by side. So I walked up to teller number one. I asked for a notary. She pointed to teller number two. She said, that would be Rosella over here. She's, she's also a notary, and she'll take care of you. I said, thank you very much. I stepped over to Rosella's window, and we started doing the usual notary stuff, right? Signing this, stamping that. You know, no big deal. And she was lovely, but there wasn't any kind of profound conversation going on here. It was just small talk. Now, what I need you guys to understand is that I didn't say anything to Rosella about what I was doing there. I didn't say any, you know, I didn't tell her that the next day I was going to be speaking to the big bosses of her company. I didn't say anything to Rosella about my philosophy of leadership, right? It was sign this, stamp that, small talk. And then when she stamped the last stamp, I asked her a question that I've asked every notary that I've ever used before. I said, um, what do I owe you? And she said, oh, no, you don't owe me anything. This is just a service that we provide to our customers. And I said, well, Rosella, you know, I'm not a customer. And she said, oh, that's okay. Maybe you will be someday. And I thought, hey, you know, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And then I was just, I was struck with this inspiration to ask her this question, which in, in retrospect seems like an obvious question. I said, hey, Rosella, would you mind telling me, how do you like working here? What's it like working here at Santander? And I'm telling you guys, I'm not exaggerating this. There was no hesitation. Her face lit up, and she said, I love it. Just like that, I love it. Well, it wasn't just like that. I mean, she had this lovely island accent, which I'm not going not gonna to try to imitate. But she started talking about these other banks that she'd worked for before and how different they were, and, and, and you know, they were just a you know, terrible place to work. But this place was so supportive and, and a kind of a community feel, and, and she's talking about her customers and how sometimes her customers just stop by to say hello, even when they have no business to do. They just want to say, they just want to see her. And I have this weird habit, right? So when, when I'm talking to somebody or I hear something on TV or on the radio or whatever that relates to my work, I, I write it down, right? So Rosella's telling me this and I'm taking notes on the back of one of these documents I just signed and, and so this is a quote this is one of the things she said to me she said I love my customers I get great pleasure from serving them so I'm happy and she was explaining you know I love them which makes it easier for me to do my work and the happier I am the more I can serve them and the more the better I serve them the more I love this place and around and around it goes and at one point I looked up at her I said hey Rosella would you mind if I quoted you on this and she said would you like me to notarize it What do you think I said? Yes, I would. That would be great. Thank you. And she did. There you go. So what, what you're looking at here is actually the back of her business card, right? She took out her business card, flipped it over, wrote those words across the top, stamped it, shoved it across the counter to me. I ran across the street, took a picture of it with my iPhone, and stuck it in my PowerPoint deck. Why did I do that? Why do you think? Remember what I'm doing there, right? 
I'm there to speak to the senior management team. So I showed this to them the next day. I said, hey, guys, check this out. This is, this is what you have going on across the street. This is Rosella the Tella, man. I mean, she is, she is awesome. And, and the boss was so impressed by this that he went across the street to say thank you to Rosella. And you can imagine how that blew her mind and what that did for her experience in working there and around and around it goes. Please, don't tell me that love has no place in business. Of course it does. If we can create an environment that people love working in, that's the key here. If we can create that kind of culture, whether it's the culture of our team or the culture of an entire company, whatever the context is, that, that's the way that we, that we can create and sustain an incredible customer-client experience in a, in a meaningful way over time. It's about creating that culture. And when we do that, it has implications throughout the entire company. I mean, not just these little, you know, micro interactions between an employee of the company and, and a customer, but the, the, the nature, the, the value, the actual value of the company itself. It impacts that as well. What does cultivating love have to do with the value of a company? Well, let's ask only the most successful investor in companies on the planet, okay? What do you think Warren Buffett would say about this? So I happened to catch an interview with Warren Buffett on, I was just surfing the web one day, and I found an interview with him on the Motley Fool website. And the question they were asking Warren Buffett was, um, you know, how do you determine what value a company, you know, or how do you determine what companies you're going to buy? How do you really determine the value of a, of a, of a good investment? And he said the, the things that you'd, you know, you'd expect him to say in terms of the competitive landscape and the balance sheets and you know, all that you know, number stuff. But then he said, in the final analysis, I have to sit down in the room with the CEO of the company and I have to look into their eyes. And there's something very specific that he's looking for. He said, I look into their eyes and I try to figure out whether they love the money or if they love the business. If they don't love the business, I can't put my money into it. If they do love the business and I buy the company, then my job is to make sure that I don't do anything that kills that love of the business. Now listen, I know this isn't a hard science, but let me just, I'm just looking at my confidence monitor here for a minute. I guess you can see, one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, Four times he mentions the word love in 15 seconds. And he goes on to say that if, if I don't see the love of the business, then what I'm pretty clear on is, you know, if I look into their eyes and all I see is the, is the dollar signs and I can kind of hear the cash register ringing, he said that I know that really all they're interested in is the exit strategy and how quickly they can put the money into their pocket and get the hell out of here. And I'm trying to invest in, in an asset that's going to last over time. And that valuable asset is driven by the love for that company because it has implications in everything that they do. So please don't tell me that love is no place in business. So this is our best customer approach. It's our best cultural approach. It's our best recruitment approach. It's our best value approach. But all of this gets very personal very quickly. Because I would suggest to you that none of this can happen unless we look here first. What it comes down to is our own connection with the work that we do every day. So let me tee up this part of the conversation uh, at the risk of citing an overused example, all right? Let's, let's just talk for a second about Steve Jobs and Apple. I'm not going to rehash the whole Apple story because we all know it. Uh, we know what Steve Jobs accomplished in his lifetime. Uh, there was a period of time that some of us may have forgotten about, though, when he experienced probably the most significant and public humiliation and failure in the technology world when he got fired from Apple. Do you guys remember that? He brought in John Scully to help him run the company, and about 10 minutes later, the board forced him out. So here's a guy who quite literally got fired from the love of his life, which is the way he often described Apple, it was the love of his life. I'm not sure what his wife felt about that, but that's the way he described it. Well, he gave the commencement address at Stanford University, the graduating class of 05. Very famous speech now. If you haven't heard it, I recommend you listen to it. You can, you can find it on iTunes. That shouldn't surprise you. Uh, or Google it. You'll find it in 30 seconds. Um, and he's telling his story. And when he got to the part where he talked about how he made it through the difficult times, here's what he said. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. The only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. 
So I'm not making this up, in other words. So let me, let me net this out for you. Doing what you love is important, certainly. It's the foundation of all of this, but it's not the whole story. I would suggest that it's more than doing what you love. It's do what you love in the service of people who love what you do. Do what you love in the service of people who love what you do. Doing what you love is important, but it's not the whole story, right? I mean, one could argue that, you know, criminals are doing what they love too. That doesn't necessarily qualify them for extreme leadership, right? So it's doing what you love in the service of people. So your, your heart is in it, but you're using that in order to give great value and have an impact on somebody else, right? And not just serving people because we have to, but serving people in such a profound way that the impact is they love us back. They love us in return. This is what Rosella the Teller does. She does what she loves in the service of people who then love her in return and around and around it goes. Same for us. Do what you love in the service of people who love what you do. Now, I'm going to guess that in this room, and this is an educated guess, because this is, tends to be the case whenever you, you bring more than a couple of human beings together. I'm going to guess that in this room there's a spectrum. Some of you, you look at this, you say, that is me, that describes who I am, that's perfect. And others of you, you know, maybe not so much. So the question is, you know, no matter where you are in that spectrum from, um, uh, I'm not, I, I, uh, this is a foreign concept, this idea of loving my work, to, yeah, man, right on. Wherever you are in that spectrum, the question is, how do we take it? further? How do we get closer to that ideal? Because none of us is living at our absolute ideal, I would guess. So I have um, a series of questions for you here this morning. Now, these are not rhetorical questions. They're not meant as kind of, you know, interesting philosophical questions. These are questions that demand to be asked and answered, in my opinion. So here's non-rhetorical question number one. And this is an extreme leadership practice in and of itself, answering this question. And it's some variation on this theme. There are lots of potential questions embedded in here. Why do I love this, whatever it is? You pick the context, business idea, product, colleague, customer, and how do I show it? Why do I love this work, generically speaking, and how do I show it? Let me be very clear as to what I'm asking you to do with this question. I'm asking you to make it a habit of asking yourself this question frequently. I'm the first to admit some days this question is easier to answer than other days, right? Some days you drive to work in the morning, and it's no problem. You drive to work, you arrive at your office, throw open the doors, and say, why do I love this work? Let me count the ways. And you can write a sonnet to everybody on your team, and it's just glorious. And then there are other days where, uh, let's just say it's a bit more of a stretch. The question doesn't even come out the same way. It's not, why do I love this? It's more like, why the hell did I sign up for this? And really, all I want to do is go back to bed. And I will suggest to you that the more difficult it is to answer this question, the more important it is to answer this question. Because this question is designed to help you pick whatever metaphor works best for you. Flip your own switch, stoke your own fire, trip your own trigger, whatever. This is designed to help you inspire yourself. Because it's virtually impossible to inspire, engage, motivate, drive anybody else unless we have it ourselves first. So if you get this down, if you kind of make this a habit, stoke your own fire a little bit, the rest of this leap framework just leaps out naturally. And it takes us right into the discussion of energy, which is an interesting topic for this room, don't you think? I mean, you guys are in the energy business, but th I'm talking here about, about very personal kind of energy, right? The energy that, that you feel. And this is not a metaphysical thing. It's a very tangible thing. You know when you have energy and you know when you don't, right? You know those days where you jump out of bed. You know those days where you fall out of bed. A very different experience. You know when you're around energetic people and when you're not. Is that true? Have you ever worked with, for, or around somebody that was... Uh, let's just say, a bit lacking on the energy scale. Have you? Did you ever work for anybody like this, for example? The thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. What's wrong with this picture? There's nothing there, right? This is, this is the walking dead, basically. This is a zombie, and I guarantee you that any team, division, department, company, whatever, that's led by somebody who's dead like this is going to create clones all the way throughout the rest of that piece of the organization. It's like the, like the zombie apocalypse, right? And, and that's going to translate in some way, shape, or form into the customer's experience. And I know you guys have had the same experience I have. I can walk, for example, into the lobby or reception area of a company that I've never visited before, and within 30 seconds, I could tell if this place is cool, if it's interesting, if it's exciting, if it's energetic, or if it's a morgue. 30 seconds. And you know, unless it's a morgue, it shouldn't feel like a morgue. And I suppose you can even argue that if you wanted to. 
But a place that comes across as being exciting and energetic is much more likely to be cranking out products and services their customers are going to love. And I'm also suggesting that it's not an accident. It's a direct result of the level of energy that leaders, and remember, I don't mean necessarily just the positional leaders, that leaders are putting into that place or not. The energy comes from what we put into it. So here's, uh, here's a way to start thinking about this. The question is, what kind of impact do you have on the energy around you at work? And make no mistake about it, you do have an impact on the energy around you at work. So here's a way to start thinking about it. It's a good question to ask yourself. It's kind of a litmus test question, okay? So ask yourself this question. Um, you don't have to answer it out loud. Just consider, all right? Question is, do I generate more energy when I walk into a room or when I walk out of it? <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, we've all known these people. They're like the walking vacuums of the human spirit, man. They're like the energy vampires. All they have to do is walk into the room. They don't even have to say anything. They just walk in, and you see it in the body language of everybody else in that room. It's like they suck the life out of the place, and you see everybody else just kind of shrivel up and wither and die until that person leaves. And then suddenly the clouds break, the sun comes out, the birds start chirping, and we get back to doing great work again. We want to make sure that we're not that person is really all I'm saying, that we're putting more energy in than we're taking out. So... How do we go about doing that? Let me start with Noel Tishy, professor of leadership at the University of Michigan. Um, this is from his classic work published in a book called The Leadership Engine. Here's what he observed. He said, leaders model the intensity and the energy that it takes to stay ahead competitively and to meet ever more ambitious goals. They do this because they love what they do. So there it is again. His words, his research, not mine. Same conclusion. If you love what you do, the energy comes out naturally. So idea number one, how do you generate energy, goes back to cultivate love. So love generates energy. It's a natural outgrowth of, of the first practice here, right? But beyond that, there are probably thousands of things that we could do every day to generate, you know, put a little more energy in than we're taking out, and they all add up. So for the sake of discussion today, let me boil it down to one. This is one very powerful idea, and it's got a lot of leverage to it because it's fairly easy to do, and it generates tremendous energy when it's done well. And what it has to do with is, again, you and your perspective, your own perspective on the work you do every day, you and yours do every day. So the question on the table for the next few minutes is going to be this. What do I slash we really do here? What do we really do beyond the transactional nature of our work? Beyond the stuff that we do every day, what do we really do? John Chambers, CEO of Cisco Systems, referred to this as the higher meaning and purpose in our work. Now, here's what blows my mind about this question as a business guy. It's just astounding where we can find that meaning in our work. Now, so for, I'll give you a couple examples, right? So right now, if you just look around the room right now, go ahead, look around the room, move your head, move your eyeballs, look around. Everything that you see in here, with the exception of your fellow human beings, everything that you see in here is made by a company somewhere, right? The chairs you're sitting on, the carpet on the floor, the tablecloth, the paneling on the walls, the light fixtures, all this, all made by a company somewhere. There's human beings behind all of this stuff, right? Now, we look at this stuff, and that's what we think. Stuff, 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 stuff. Boring, mundane, commodity stuff. But when you look at the leading companies in whatever the arena is, whatever the product or service is, no matter how boring or mundane their product or service appears to be to the rest of us, to them, it's anything but boring. To them, it's the most exciting stuff on the planet, and they're the ones that everybody else is always chasing after. So the meaning that we derive from it is what we, is what we bring to it with, with, with conscious intent. Let me give you a couple, a couple of specifics, okay? Uh, let's talk for a moment about Gillette, okay? So we all, we all know the company. Uh, Gillette was acquired by Procter & Gamble a while back for $57 billion. Do you guys remember that? And it was shocking to a lot of us because when you and I and the average person on the street thinks about Gillette, what do we think? What, what, what do they make? What business are they in? They make razor blades. They're in the shaving business, right? They make razor blades. Woo! I mean, can you imagine working for Gillette, driving to work in the morning, thinking about this energy thing, and saying to yourself, what am I going to do today? I'm going to make razor blades, man. Hit the gas. Get me there faster. Be a bit of a stretch for me, I have to say. 
But that's, but that's the way they are there. And there was this great article a while back in the Wall Street Journal. It was a profile on Gillette. And the question behind the writer's visit to Gillette was, how do they create a whole company, a whole culture where people are so passionate, so turned on, so energetic about razor blades and shaving? Which is really a good question. And it turns out it starts in the hiring process. So they tell the story of this young woman, she's a business school graduate, she wants to work at Gillette, so she gets called in, she goes through all the interviews, one after another after another, really extensive process, she makes it all the way to the last interview, and as far as she can tell, she's in, I mean, she's doing great, right, she made it all the way to the last interview, and the last question that she was asked in the last interview was this, so, do you have any qualms, anything you're concerned about after spending all this time with us here at Gillette? And I don't know if it was the interview jitters or if she was just trying to lighten the mood or take the pressure off or whatever, but just kind of half kidding, she said, well, you know, I'm not so sure I want to spend the rest of my life worrying about underarms. <laughs> worrying about underarms. Ah, funny. Guess what? She didn't get the job. End of the line right there. Why? They want people who want to spend the rest of their lives worrying about underarms. That's what they do. They worry about underarms and legs and faces and backs, whatever. <clears throat> it's true. So then they go down into the, uh, into the uh, prototype model shop, and they talk to a guy named George Turchinas, who was a manager of the prototype model shop and also had the title of preferred tester. So what do you gather from that? What does this guy do for a living? He shaves. Now, now listen to what he said. I'm just going to warn you ahead of time. This is going to sound kind of sick, all right? And not sick as in bad as in good, but sick as in twisted. Uh, here's, here's what he said, and I quote, We bleed, so you'll get a good shave at home. <laughs> this is my 27th year, he said. Came here my first week, haven't missed a day of shaving. We bleed, so you'll get a good shave at home. You guys have a mission statement where, where you work? <laughs> That's a hell of a mission statement, if you ask me. So then they go down into the Shaving Technology Laboratory. They talk to Donald Chalk, Vice President of the Shaving Technology Laboratory. I think that pretty much says it all. And they ask him to describe what happens here, what, you know, this so-called you know, amazing, so, amazing sounding shaving technology laboratory. What do you do here? Now listen to the way he answers this question. Uh, I loved it so much, I, I, I memorized it pretty much word for word. You tell me if there's any energy in this. Here's what he said. We test the blade guard, the blade edge, the angle of the razor, the balance of the handle, the length, the heft, the width, what happens to the chemistry of the skin, what happens to the hair when you pull it, what happens to the follicle. We own the face, he said. We know more about shaving than anybody. I don't think obsession is too strong a word. And then he paused and he said, I've got to be careful. I don't want to sound crazy. <laughs> well, too late for that, Donald. <laughs> but that's not crazy, that, that's energy, right? So listen, here's the thing. Does Gillette make razor blades? Sure, they make razor blades, but the point is they don't make razor blades. There's something much bigger going on there, right? And listen, I know I'm oversimplifying Gillette. They bake a lot more than razor blades. They have lots of other you know, products and lines of business and all that, but you know what? Just in the razor blade market alone, these guys have over 70% of the world's market share in razor blades. And they're the ones to beat as far as shaving technology goes. Just ask anybody at Schick, for example, right? They're always chasing after these guys. Now you know why. They own the face. So then I was in, I was in Chicago a while back and I was speaking at a supply chain management conference and I shared this example about Gillette and then as often happens, a couple days later I got back to my office and I had an email from somebody who was in that group who works at the corporate office of the container store. Now, are you guys familiar with the container store? All right, so whether or not you've ever actually been in a container store, what would you gather from the name of the company? What do they sell? Containers. They sell stuff that you put stuff in, right? And this, this woman wrote to tell me, she said, listen, I heard what you said about Gillette, but I'm here to tell you, if you think Gillette gets excited about razor blades, you should see how excited we get about trash cans. And she was serious. She sent me this whole pile of material from the container store, all these uh, you know, internal stuff like employee newsletters and training materials and all that. And what emanated from that stuff was, first of all, how much these people love their company, but also the energy they have about how they sell that stuff to the rest of us. 
Fortune magazine every year puts out its list on 100 best companies to work for in the U.S. Container store is on that list every freaking year. Trash cans. So then I was down in Mexico. I was doing some work for Discovery Network. They had a client event for their Latin American uh, customers. And as you can imagine, their customers are people that advertise on Discovery, right? So these are PR people and advertising people and brand managers, consumer products folks. And I talked about Gillette. I mentioned the container store. And when I was finished, this young woman from Colombia came up to me and she pulled me aside and she said, I listened very carefully to what you had to say and I know exactly what you mean. She said, I work for Kimberly Clark. I'm the brand manager in the Latin American markets for Huggies Diapers. And then she said, so you can imagine what I'm obsessed with. <laughs> Which, you know, I thought, I thought it was pretty funny, right? I mean, obviously, it's, you know, it's not, not the face that she owns. <laughs> and she said, she said, however, however, I am not in the business of selling diapers. I'm in the business of creating happy babies and happy moms. She said, that's what I really do, and that's what I tell people all the time. That's what I really do. That's what I tell people all the time. So let's review for a moment, shall we? Just stop and review. Razor, bla uh, razor blades, trash cans, and diapers. I mean, if that doesn't sound like a landfill, I don't know what does. Right? So you see where I'm going with this, don't you? I mean, come on, man. If it's possible to get excited and energetic about that stuff, don't tell me there's nothing to get excited and energetic about in the kind of work that you do. Of course there is. But the question is, are you clear on it and are you telling people all the time? And sometimes, you know, especially when I think about the work that you guys do, bringing power to our homes, bringing clean water into our lives, bringing heat to our environment, it's so obvious, it's so necessary, it's such a utility that it's easy to forget how profound it really is, especially for you because you're so close to it. So what I will suggest to you is that, is that it's, 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 it's our job as leaders to, to elevate what we do, to, to, to bring out that higher meaning and purpose and communicate it with people. Um, just uh, fairly recently, I was uh, speaking at another conference. You know, I do a lot of that. And uh, I was doing a book signing afterwards. And there were a couple of folks that uh, when they got up to the table, they said, we just wanted to come by and say thank you for talking about us. Well, it turns out they work at the corporate office of the container store. And they said, uh, you know, that, that person that sent you all that stuff, that was Amy Corvallo. I, we, we remember when she sent you that stuff about us. And, you know, it's a great company, and we just, we just wanted to say thanks. And I said, you're, I said, you're welcome. By the way, um, I noticed you guys were number, I can't remember what the number was, 13 on the 100 best company list this year. Is that accurate? What do you think? And they said, nope, should be number one. And I thought that was pretty cool because these were a couple of, you know, middle managers in their company who are often, you know, middle management is often criticized as being kind of the stopgap in a company and the blockage and all that garbage. And to them, they had this incredible pride. And then uh, a few days later, uh, one of those people, his name is Jason, sent me this email, which I'd like to share with you. He said, at the container store, we do love our trash cans and any other container <laughs> under the sun, but those are merely the vehicles we use to develop our peers and teams. Our true passion and love is putting our employees first and developing them to be exceptional, selfless leaders. Isn't that cool? From trash cans to servant leaders. So that brings us to non-rhetorical question number two for the morning. This is the question for you. What do I slash we really do here? What's the higher meaning and purpose of our work? And you notice I've added a little tagline here. It says, answer out loud, please. So again, what I'm asking you to do is, is very simple, yet has, has profound impact. Take the time to answer this question honestly and authentically for yourself and on behalf of the people that you're responsible for and or work with, and answer it honestly. And then when you, when you have answered it, you'll know that it's the right answer because you'll feel the energy. You'll feel that click in your chest. And that's where the out loud part comes in. All that means is talk about it. Talk about it every chance you get. Talk about it with your colleagues. Talk about it with your employees, with your clients, with the community. Talk about it. Talk about it. Talk about it. Because for the most part, we human beings have a very deep primal need to be a part of something great. 
And it's very easy in the day-to-day -day crush and pressure of things to forget why the work that we're doing is so important. And if we can remind ourselves or remind other people, it's incredibly energizing for us. And it's great if you could do that, if you can generate the energy in your team or your company. But that's not the end of the story. It's not about energy for energy's sake. The question then becomes, what can we do with that energy that we create? I mean, if you guys bring electricity into my house, the, the, elect, the fact that the electricity is there isn't what's significant. What's significant is all the things that it, that it quite literally empowers me to do. So what can we do with the energy that we create, the human energy that we create? And this is where the practice of inspiring audacity comes into play. This is a very highly charged word. It's one of my favorite words, I have to admit. So let me, let me define it for you because it has a lot of shades of meaning and connotations to it. Two parts of this definition. First of all, we can say that audacity is a bold and blatant disregard for normal constraints. This is not think outside the box. This is what box. See the difference? Bold and blatant disregard for normal constraints but not just for the purpose of creating chaos, that's not what this is about, in order to do something very specific and very uh, significant, in order to change the world for the better. A bold and blatant disregard for normal constraints in order to change the world for the better. The audacity to think that any one of us or collection of us can change the world is exactly the right kind of audacity, and it demands a bold and blatant disregard of probably the most insidious so-called normal constraint that we put on ourselves, which is, I can't do that. I'm not Gandhi, I'm not Martin Luther King, I'm not Mother Teresa, I'm not Nelson Mandela, I'm not a world changer, I don't have the, the time, the imagination, the resource, the intelligence, the charisma, the context, blah, 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 change the world, are you kidding? And this, if somebody else wants to, I will gladly stand up and applaud. I might even write them a check. But don't ask me to do that because I'm just me. And frankly, I think that's a very dangerous constraint that we put on ourselves. And if I could be blunt with you guys, could I be blunt with you guys? It's a lie. It's a flat-out lie. And it's a very convenient lie that we tell ourselves. Because in believing that lie that I can't change the world, essentially what I'm doing is abdicating my responsibility for changing the world to somebody else which then gives me license to sit back and bitch and moan why things aren't better. So instead, instead, let's reconsider what we're capable of. And I, I think one of the things that gets us, uh, that stops us in our track is, is the word world, because we tend to interpret it in, in the broadest possible sense, capital W world, whole wide world, as we used to say when we were kids. Which is great. I mean, I'll, I'll just say it like this. I mean, if you guys can figure out a way through the work that you do every day, and it may not be a stretch for many of you, if you can figure out a way to change the so-called whole wide world for the better, I say God bless you, more power to you, have at it, what are you waiting for? But what I'm also suggesting is it's not our only option. Because this so-called whole wide world that we live in is made up of a lot of smaller W worlds, right, that we do have direct impact over every day. That, that literally every one of us does. And literally, by the way, is a word I use literally. So what about, for example, changing the world of your industry? What about changing the world of your customers? What about changing the world of your company, of your team? What about changing the world of your community, your neighborhood, your family? One person in your family, for that matter. I mean, these aren't any less noble, are they? And they do add up. And they are, here comes that word again, literally within the scope of every single person sitting in this room here this morning, should we choose to step up to that challenge? And if for no other reason, I'm here today to ask you to choose to step up to that challenge. Now listen, I'm not going to ask you to stand up and make a, make a commitment to this, although it wouldn't be a bad idea. But let's, let's just do it a little bit more subtly, all right? If, you, if you're tracking with me on this, and, and you can identify that small W world, and you really, you really would like to change that, do whatever you can to change that piece of the world for the better. Would you just let me know just by nodding your head in kind of a subtle, you know, uh, auction sort of a way. Good. I see a lot, a, lot of, a lot of heads nodding. Okay, good. I see some heads, you know, not nodding. Some of you are looking to see whose heads are nodding or not nodding. I get, I get that. A little judgment going on here. That's okay. It's, it's up to you. Uh, but here, so let me share an observation with you. 
So as you can imagine, I've asked that question of countless people all over the world. And I'm happy to say that I, I do often see a lot of heads nodding in response to that. But that, that then begs a question. Why are there so many heads nodding, but not a lot of world changing going on? There seems to be a gap between the intent, between our desire to change things for the better and our willingness to actually do it. Uh, and and it's, it's a very human thing. And, I, and I, I don't claim to have it all figured out, but I think I know one of the reasons that it's, that, that one of the things that, that holds us back. And if we can get a handle on this, we could change everything in an instant. And that one thing that holds us back, I can characterize in one word that has a lot of negative connotations to it, it's fear, fear. We're scared to. It's a risky endeavor. It's putting ourselves out there in ways that we haven't before in order to change things. That's scary. What, I, what I'm going to suggest to you is that that fear in that context, it's, it's almost like fear and exhilaration kind of mixed in together, is actually a good thing. We, we interpret it as a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing in the right context. And that instead of letting it scare us quite literally away, that maybe we should move towards it. I would suggest that we should live, you and I should live, in conscious pursuit of the OSM. Now, let me explain what I mean here by way of, by way of metaphor. Uh, what you're looking at here is a picture of Jimmy Shea, who won the gold medal in the 2002 Winter Olympics for the, the skeleton event. If you missed skeleton, let me describe it for you this way. It's like, it's an extreme sport. It's like extreme luge, as if that weren't extreme enough to begin with, right? It takes place on that same kind of, you know, track of ice going down the mountain. But the difference is, you can kind of see here from this picture, is that first of all, the skeleton board is a little thing. It's like the size of a roasting pan. And these guys lie down on this thing on their stomachs, and they go head first down the mountain with the chin about six inches off of the ice. They're screaming down the mountain at a million miles an hour. So you can imagine what happens if you wipe out doing this sort of thing. It's not, not a pretty sight. This is why it's called an extreme sport. These people are extremely nuts, right? So I'm not suggesting that you have to take up skeleton in order to understand what we're talking about here, but imagine for a moment that you wanted to, okay? You saw it on TV, you thought it looked pretty cool, so you figure you're going to give it a try for yourself. So you go out, you get your equipment together, you know, get yourself a roasting pan, uh, steal your kid's bicycle helmet. Now, now imagine this, the day finally arrives where you're ready to take on the mountain. You got your board in your hand, helmet on your head, and you're approaching the track from down below, right? You're looking up at this thing as you're walking towards the mountain. And from down here, yeah, it looks, it looks pretty challenging. But from down here, as you're scoping out the angle of this thing, right, kind of like this, you're thinking, I can handle that. This is going to be awesome. That's what you're thinking. Then you take the lift up to the top of the mountain. Now, if you're bored in your hand, for the first time, from the top of the mountain, you step up to the edge of the track, and for the first time, you look down. Is it any different up here than it was from down there? Is it? Is the, is the, what's the angle like from up here? Remember? Angle, right? What's it like from up here? There's no angle. It's a straight drop into the abyss, man. So now, now you're, 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 you're a little freaked out. I mean, your hands are shaking on the board. Your sweat's breaking out of your forehead. Your heart's pounding in your chest. And really all you're thinking is, I want to go home. But you can't walk back down the mountain, which is what you really want to do, because everybody's watching you, right? So this is the only way down. So here's what you do. You give yourself a little pep talk. You say, okay, all right. I'm not so sure about this, but I'll just try it. I'll just try it for a couple of minutes. We'll see how it goes. If I don't like it, I'll pull off to the side. You teeter on the edge for a few more minutes. You finally take a deep breath. You push off, and before you know it, bang, you're going a million miles an hour, and you suddenly realize that you are now 100% committed to this idea, right? There is no turning back now. Typically, at that point of the process, there are two words that come to mind. What are they? Huh? <laughs> yeah, I heard it over here. Nice job, class. Nicely done. M stands for moment. You got the idea? You see where I'm going with this? All right, so here, here's what I'm suggesting, okay? It's a very simple thing. The OSM is a natural thing. It's part of being human. It's part of the human experience. And it actually serves as an indicator that we're about to do something extraordinary. And again, I am telling you something that you're already, you already know because it's part of being human. So just imagine a couple of scenarios. Think back over the course of your career. Have you ever taken on a challenge? Maybe it was a move to a new city, maybe it was a new job, a new company, um, 
and, and you took this on because rationally and intellectually it made perfect sense. It was good for your career, you're going to make more money, or whatever it is, right? So you listed it all out, but it was beyond something you'd ever done before. So even though it made good rational sense, when it came time to actually follow through and do the thing, tell me there was no OSM there. Of course there was. It's a natural part of the process. I'll give you a day-to-day -day example. Uh, how many of you are married? Can I see your hands, please? Okay, good. Lots of you. Think back for a moment to your wedding day. Tell me there was no OSM on your wedding day. I mean, yeah, sure, this is the love of your life and all that. I get it. But you tell me that when you were saying, I do, you weren't also thinking, oh, shit. I mean, tell me that wasn't happening. I mean, it's a natural part of the process. I, I know it's true. I've, I've had that experience twice, as a matter of fact. I know it's true. But it's, it's most significantly true, I would suggest to you, in the act of leadership. So let me say this a couple of different ways. If you're not experiencing the OSM in the context of your leadership endeavors at work, but you're calling yourself a leader, you're not there yet. This is very counterintuitive because we're, it's almost like we're, we're hardwired to run away, to avoid the OSM. And I'm suggesting that in the right context, we should run towards it. We interpret the OSM as a sign that something is wrong. And what makes this challenging is that sometimes the OSM is a sign <laughs> that something is wrong. But oftentimes, it's actually a sign that something is right. If there's no OSM, you're not, there, there's no audacity. This is, this is the subjective side. This is what audacity feels like. This is what extreme leadership feels like. It's an internal indicator that we have to know if we're really doing it or not. I saw Jimmy Shea interviewed the day after he won the gold medal. And the question he was asked was, do you remember the first time he ever tried the skeleton thing? And his answer was such a beautiful description of the OSM, that what do you think I did? I scrambled around for a piece of paper to write it down so I could get it word for word. Here's what he said. Oh, yeah, I remember. First time I went down that run, I was going way too fast, and I realized I just made the biggest mistake of my life. But when I got to the bottom, I couldn't wait to get back up and do it again. <laughs> I realized I'd made the biggest mistake of my life. It wasn't a mistake. Did he ever make mistakes? Of course. Did he ever crash and burn? Gloriously. But the act of skeleton was not a mistake. Yet, he said, I realized I'd made a mistake. It's a powerful word because it means reality, realized and reality. So what he's telling us is that in that moment, that first time he ever tried this thing, what his brain was telling him as reality, as absolute, undeniable truth, his brain was telling him, this is bad. That's what he was thinking. He wasn't thinking, my, what an exhilarating experience. I'm so glad I came out to the mountain. I should be a gold medalist one day. He was thinking, I'm a moron. But there was no way he was ever going to win that gold medal or anybody else who ever won a gold medal would ever win one without that frequent experience of the OSM. It's exactly the same way for us. So let me share with you non-rhetorical question number three, which is the world's greatest OSM generator. How are we going to change the world of our customers, market, industry, et cetera? You define what world is and put this on the strategy table along with all the other business questions you got to ask yourself every day and see where that leads you. And let's just acknowledge that all of this stuff is easy to talk about, it's fun to talk about, it's inspiring to talk about, but in the final analysis, as we've all heard over and over throughout our lives, talk is cheap. So it really comes down to this. We have to prove that we mean what we say. It's one thing to talk about changing the world, it's another thing to prove that we mean it. It's one thing to talk about cultivating love, it's another thing to prove that we love people, right? Prove it, prove it, prove it. And this is something that we've been trained to, to understand and believe. We know it. Uh, the way that we prove ourselves to others, you know, there's lots of words in our lexicon as English speakers that we use to describe this phenomenon. We've called it walk your talk. We've called it practice what you preach. We've called it put your money where your mouth is. We've called it lead by example. Jim Cousis and Barry Posner, who I mentioned earlier, called it dwizzywid. Is how you pronounce that. Which stands for what, would you guess? 
Do what you say you will do. Do what you say you will do. That's how I prove I mean it to somebody else. If words come out of my mouth, I make sure that my actions line up with it. I've got to be absolutely 100% certain whenever humanly possible that my words and my actions are in alignment. Because if I say one thing, but I do another, at the very least, I'm going to confuse you. And at the very worst, I'm going to completely disengage you and turn you into a cynic. This has to do with our own personal credibility. If I say one thing and do another, I'm not going to get anything done with you. Let me see if I can demonstrate this for you real quick. All right, let's try a little teamwork exercise. Uh, would you all put your hands out in front of you like so, please, just like this. And the drill is we're all going to clap once at exactly the same moment, so it's going to sound like one loud thunderous clap, okay? And I'll be the leader, so let's all clap when I count three. Ready? On the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Okay, one more time, one more time, try it again. On the count of three, here we go. One, two, three. I still got about a third of you there. So let's, uh, let's analyze that for a moment. Uh, first time around, what were you following, my words or my actions? Actions, almost to a person. Which again, tells us something we already know. Actions speak louder than words. It's a very compelling thing. People are watching us. Let's make sure our actions are, are appropriate, fine. But the second time around, what were you following, my words or my actions? Uh, some of you are, some of you weren't. I mean, did you feel the confusion starting in here? It's like, what, what does he want, man? Because I'm saying one thing, but I'm doing another. Well, you know what? If I kept doing that to you pretty soon, you're not going to do anything I ask you to do anymore because you don't trust me anymore. Here, try this. Put your finger in the air like so, if you would. See, some of you are reluctant to do that already. <clears throat> All right, now take that finger and put it right here on your chin. Your chin, that's this part of your face right here. That would be your chin. You even knew I was setting you up, and about a quarter of you still fell for that. So if I kept doing th that, to, well, if I kept doing that to you, pretty soon it's a, it's a different finger you're going to be putting in the air. <clears throat> but pretty soon you'll you'll be done with me, right? You're not going to follow me anywhere. Now that's just a cute little game. But if you magnify that a thousand times, that's what happens every day at work. Listen, I'm not saying it's fair. I'm not saying it's just because none of us is perfect. But it's a fact, it's an undeniable, indisputable fact that the minute you step into a leadership role, people watch everything you do. And by everything, I, I mean everything. I'm not exaggerating. They watch your body language, your facial expressions, and all that, but they also watch the way you spend your time, the way you allocate resources, the way you make decisions, the way you communicate with people, and they compare it to your own words. You know the word accountability? Is that popular where you work? Here's the way I typically hear that word used. Accountability is that thing that we desperately want other people to take. And while it's true that those people need to be more accountable, this is about holding ourselves accountable to our own words, ridiculously accountable to our own words. That's how we prove to others that we're worth following. So that brings us to our last non-rhetorical question of the morning, uh, which is uh, really just a yes or no question. Do I really want to do this stuff? Do I really want to do this? Um, now, by this, I mean, and this is a good question to ask about anything that we encounter, but in this case, I mean cultivate love, generate energy, inspire audacity, provide proof, pursue the OSM, change the world, extreme leadership. Do I really want to do this? Now, if the answer to this question is no, that's cool. And I don't mean this to sound snarky, but I hope then you have been grossly over-entertained for the last hour or so because then that's what this is. It's entertainment. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with entertainment. Uh, on the other hand, if the answer is yes, the question is what do we do next, right? Uh, so there's a couple of things. I've been giving you some resources all morning, these questions. Why do I love my work? What do we really do around here? How are we going to change the world? What's your next OSM opportunity? Start to put these questions into practice. Use them, and it will lead you into all kinds of applications that you'll discover for yourself. I can promise you that. Over and above that, I'd like to offer you uh, another invitation. Um, I have put together an audio course, and I've gotten great feedback on this. Uh, I'd like you to have it. Of course, it's free. All you have to do is text the word AUDIO to that number, 717-303-5000. Now, um, it's all set up on an autoresponder. It's, it's pretty cool little technology. 
but here's what I need you to know. When you get the audio from me, my autoresponder is sending that to you, but the email address that it's coming from is mine, all right? So all you have to do anytime along the way, if you have a question, comment, concern, emotional outburst, uh, you'd like to have a conversation, hit reply and it comes directly to me, okay? So this is, this is our way of, it's my way of, have, of continuing our conversation. My promise to you is that if you, if you send me a message, I will respond to you. It may not be immediately, but I promise I will, okay? Do what you say you will do. Now, here's the last thought that I'd like to leave you with. We have uh, focused our conversation here this morning on the world of business. But I'd also like you to consider the, the application of these ideas in all the other roles that you play in your life, in your families, in your communities, in your places of worship, in your, wherever it is, your philanthropic endeavors, because I, I know these ideas apply there. Because even though I'm a business guy and I write business books, um, I've heard from lots of people who've, who've told me that these ideas have made a huge difference in all the roles that they play. And I guess it's no surprise because in the very beginning, when I first started writing my first book, uh, it's called The Radical Leap, which is just now coming out in its 10th anniversary edition. So I started writing it 10 years ago, over 10 years ago. I was getting feedback from outside the world of work almost immediately. And I, I mentioned to you guys earlier that I live in San Diego. And when I first started writing uh, The Radical Leap, I was living in the Mission Beach area of San Diego. Now, if, if any of you have ever been to Mission Beach, you know what I'm talking about when I say uh, Mission Beach is kind of like uh, the quintessential Southern California beach town. It's slacker central, right? It's surfers, it's skaters, it's sunbathers, it's a boardwalk, people you know, skating by all day long. And I used to go there to decompress and, and just kind of chill out. But on this one particular day, if any of you are Dave Barry fans, uh, and this one particular day, uh, and I will say this, I am not making this up. I went to the beach to think about leadership because I was in the early days of writing the book and I was collecting my thoughts. I'm sitting on the beach. I'm thinking about leadership. Are you with me so far? Thinking about leadership on the beach, right? And out of nowhere, this young woman comes up to me, which was not a common occurrence, I have to say. <laughs> and she had, a, uh, she had a clipboard in her hand, and she looked down at me and she said, excuse me, sir. Would you mind answering a question for me? I said, I, I, I don't know. I guess it depends what the question is. She said, the question is, what is leadership? Come on, man. Tell me you don't think that's bizarre. I mean, it was like the Twilight Zone. It was or a camera or something. It was freaky. And I stood up and I took a step back and I said, why are you asking me this? And I explained to her what I was doing, you know, and, and she thought it was as freaky as I did. And then she explained to me that she was taking a business class at the University of San Diego. And as part of her research project, she was conducting a survey on the beach. And I thought, well, I guess this is the way we do homework in San Diego. We go to the beach and we ask. She said, I'm asking everybody to answer this question. So now I'm looking at the surfers over there and the skaters going by and the people lying in the sun over there. And I'm thinking, you know, what are they saying? How are they answering that question? Because I talk to business people about this all the time, but not surfers, you know. So I said, listen, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I'll write you something, you know, really profound and snappy. But in exchange for that, you have to show me the other responses that you're getting here on the beach. So she said, okay, good deal. She handed me a card. I wrote something, you know, tremendously helpful, I'm sure. And, uh, and then she handed me her little stack of cards. And she had them organized by gender, age, and occupation, and then a place to answer the question, what is leadership? And this ultimately ended up becoming part of the opening chapter of the Radical Leap. And I thought it would be a good place for you and I to say our farewells here this morning. We'll finish it up with some words of wisdom about leadership from Mission Beach. Are you ready? Does that sound all right? Okay, here we go. Remember, she had an organized gender, age, occupation. What is leadership? Here we go. Gender female, age 24, occupation sales. What is leadership? Organizing people around a common goal. That's pretty good. Gender male, age 26, occupation programmer. What is leadership? Standing up for what you believe in. Awesome. Gender female, age 28, occupation marketing. What is leadership? Sticking your neck out when it's the right thing to do. And this is the way it went, card after card of really good, thoughtful, insightful, and in my opinion, accurate descriptions of leadership. And then I got to the one that to me pretty much said it all. Gender male, age 23, occupation, unemployed. What is leadership? If I knew I'd have a job. 
Thank you very much, folks. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. That was very fun, enlightening. I think you gave us some things to think about, some things that we can do to really all become and work on our extreme leadership. Okay, so we're done for today um, in far, as far as this general session, but we are back here at 445 for our closing ceremony. We'll have our closing slideshow that we always do as well as prizes, and you must be here to win. So I'll see you back here at 445. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you soon. Thank you.